When I was a bachelor, airy and young, I followed the weaving trade. All the harm that ever I done was in courting a fair young maid. I courted her in the summer time and all through the winter too. And the only thing I ever did wrong was keep her from the foggy dew. This is Soundcheck at 93.9 WNYC and WNYC.org. I'm John Schaefer. Guitarist, multi-instrumentalist, singer, and arranger Martin Carthy was a prime mover in England's folk revival back in the 60s. He influenced a couple of younger Americans, Bob Dylan and Paul Simon, to name a couple. And uh, among many other aspiring folk musicians, he also married into a musical family, and together with his wife, singer Norma Watterson, and fiddler daughter Eliza Carthy, they perform these days as Watterson Carthy. Martin Carthy continues to uncover intriguing corners of the world of traditional song in the British Isles, and uh, evidence is in his latest album, called Waiting for Angels. Martin Carthy joins us here in the studio today. Martin, uh, really a thrill to have you joining us. It's nice to be here. Thank you, John. Now, in the liner notes to this the CD, Waiting for Angels, you, you talk about, you know, researching folk songs, something you've been doing for 40 years now. Has your um, methodology changed? I mean, are you looking in different places nowadays for, for old songs? Uh, well, there's a lot... Uh, oh. I look in a lot of different places, which doesn't quite answer your question. But there's uh, there, there's a lot of um, there's there's a lot of stuff to find. There's a, there's a lot of a uh, lot of places to look. A lot a lot available, whether that whether that be in books or in manuscripts, or recording, because a lot of recording was done by the BBC from the late 1930s through the 40s and well not so much in the 40s late 40s and through the 50s, mm-hmm. and other people have been recording since then. So there's a lot to look at, and uh, the, the diversity is what continues to amaze me. Yeah. Well, you know, Jim White was talking about how, you know, a lot of the southern white, the, the, the white stock of the mm. south came from, from the U.K., mm-hmm. and uh, before recordings, people like Child and Granger, you know, would come to the Appalachians to find songs that had disappeared in the, in the home country. Well, Ch- well, Child Ch- 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 never did any travelling. He sat in, he sat in Harvard University and he and he <laughs> collected all the right. various manuscripts all around him. And thank goodness he did. My goodness me, um, he put them. He you know he gave them g- gave them single headings, which was a great thing to have done. Granger, K- uh, the man who the, the man who did the first uh, travelling between uh, between Britain and um, well England and, uh, and and the USA was of course Cecil Sharp. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a lot of work had been done before before he arrived there in the uh, I think about 1915 1916 uh, people had done work before that so uh, he was he was covering ground that in a sense had been slightly explored beforehand but um what he turned up was fascinating. Right. I think he romanticized a lot, but then why not? Well, I know that's a pretty romantic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the idea of finding a, a 100, 150 year old song oh, that, that has disappeared old from that. its. Yeah. 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 It, it is a pretty romantic idea. I guess what, what people began to think in the 50s and 60s was that, you know, Sharp and Child and Granger and Vaughan Williams mm. and, and even Britain. Uh, would take these folk songs and kind of set them in amber, so to speak, uh, so that it, there was a. It seemed like there was a sense that you needed to get back to a living tradition. Yeah, I, th- I, th- I think I think that is true. They, uh, it, it's very easy to freeze these things. It's very easy to take the butterfly and nail it up on the wall and say, "Look at that butterfly! Isn't it beautiful?" And forget that the butterfly is nicest when it's fluttering around. Um, the great thing about these songs, I think, is that they is that they had they changed so much over the years, and given given half a chance, they will continue to change. That is actually what makes folk music interesting. It makes it exciting. You don't have the definitive version, at right. least ideally, in my view, you don't have definitive versions. You always want to be turning the, the, turning turning it over and seeing what's grown underneath in the in, you know in, in, in the intervening years. So how old were you when you started, you know, when you became interested in, in your own folk tradition and then started doing your own arrangements? Ooh, well, uh, the two are separated by some years. The first time I heard an English folk singer, you know, in the flesh, uh, an old-fashioned English folk singer, was when I was 17. 
and I went to Ewan McColl's club, which was called the Ballads and Blues in those days. He had the Singers Club later on. But in those days, it was the Ballads and Blues. And I went and I saw this man called Sam Lana, who was, uh, he was a Yarmouth, which is on the east coast of uh, England, um, Yarmouth fisherman. Uh, and he'd spent his, spent his life uh, fishing for herring up, in the, up in, the, in, in the North Atlantic and anywhere he could find it, and actually out in the North Sea, and just anywhere. Um, and he, uh, I saw this man, I had no idea, what, I had really, real, no real idea of what English folk music sounded like. I'd seen Cecil Sharp folk songs for schools, and that's, I mean, that, it's, it's a good collection, it's fine stuff, mm-hmm. but it's, it's, it, it's, it has, it, it's very narrowed down, you know, it's, it's right. very selected, um, which is, again, it's fine in its own way, but you never really saw the, the meat of what Sharp collected. And seeing Sam Lana gave a glimpse of something that was quite extraordinary. I was aware that just because I was English, I wasn't going. To, it didn't mean that I would understand this music. I was hearing something that was foreign to me, mm. and it was exotic. And I had recently discovered. I'm, I'm fond of saying this because I think it's true. I'd, I'd recently discovered Ravi Shankar. And it was as foreign to me as was Ravi Shankar, but it was equally exciting. I mean, Ravi Shankar was was thrilling because the the, the level, you know, the, the the level, the technical ability was extraordinary. The, the the sophistication was boundless to me, to my you know, to to my idiot ears. And then I saw this man Sam Lana, and I was just, I walked away, walking on air. I just never heard anything like it in my life. It was uh, a few. I mean that that was the moment which decided what I was going to do. Mm. So later on, I started this process of, of trying to find a way of, of playing this music, which I found so exciting. Well, and then of course the first first step was before you could start playing it or arranging it, was you had to find it, and uh, that that has occupied a lot of a lot of your time over the past. <laughs> Well, in those, <laughs> in those days, it was quite hard yeah. because uh, there was there, there was a, a wonderful library, and there still is a wonderful library at Cecil Sharp House in London. It's the Vaughan Williams Library, and but the the uh, and the man who runs it now is a man called Malcolm Taylor, who is who. It's open house. You mm. want to go and look for stuff. It's open house. In the fifties, it was different. There was definitely the feeling at Cecil Sharp House that we are the guardians of this tradition and we're guarding it against <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> so it was very, it's pretty hard to get in and look. Yeah. But, you know, things changed. There was a woman called Mrs. Noise, which is, I think is a wonderful name for a librarian. <laughs> <laughs> Truly, that very, was her name. Very Dickensian, isn't <laughs> Absolutely. it? Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, Mrs. Noise was very anxious that, uh, that we kids get a look in. So if she was on duty, she would just sneak us in and put yeah, us great. in front of books and screens and whatnot. Yeah. We're speaking with Martin Carthy, who is still uncovering... Uh, previously darkened corners of the world of English folk music and who's going to perform uh, a song for us in a moment. We'll take a quick break and then continue our conversation with Martin Carthy and hear some live music. This is Soundcheck. This is Soundcheck at 93.9 WNYC. We're online at WNYC.org. I'm John Schaefer. My guest is Martin Carthy, who is just really one of the prime movers and shakers of the English folk revival for the past 40 years. He is uh, performing as part of the group Watterson Carthy with his wife, singer Norma Watterson, and his daughter Eliza Carthy. And uh, they are performing at Satala tomorrow evening at 10 p.m. But Martin's here with guitar in hand and is going to perform for us an arrangement of the song Limbo. Here is Martin Carthy live on Soundcheck. clad and my fortune is sad and if ever I get rich it's a wonder spent all my money on the women and beer and the riches I had are all squandered 
Field after field into market I sent Till my lands were all gone and my money all spent My heart was so hard I could never repent And was that that brought me into limbo Once I could run where the others did lie I'd strut like a crow in the gutter Girls would all sigh as they saw me pass by There goes Master Fop in a flutter From the top to top gallant I hoisted my sail I'd a fine fringe cravat, cut a wig with three tails Now I am ready to gnaw my own nails And drink the cold water of limbo I had an old uncle lived out in the west When he heard my sad disaster Poor soul after that he could never take rest And his troubles grew faster and faster He come to the jail and he saw my sad case Soon as I saw him I knew his old face He stood and gazed on me like one in a maze And I wished I was miles out of limbo Oh son, if I set you once more on your pegs And I put you in credit and fashion Will you resolve to leave off your old ways And try for to govern your passion? Oh, uncle, says I, if you will set me free I promise I'll always be ruled by thee I'll labour my body for the good of my soul On the day I get outside of limbo He took out his purse, he earned three thousand pound And he counted it out in bright guineas Soon as this money my uncle lay down I run round to see Molly and Ginny In my old ragged clothes they knew naught of my gold They tossed me all out in the wet and the cold You'd have laughed if you'd heard how those Aussies did scold How they jawed me for lying in limbo On the day I got outside of limbo That is Martin Carthy, live performance of the song Limbo on Soundcheck here at 93.9 WNYC and WNYC.org. Martin and uh, England's first family of folk, the band that features his wife Norma Watterson and his daughter Eliza Carthy, are performing tomorrow night at 10 at Satala on uh, West 26th Street. Martin, um, I, I don't know that story, the, the song that you, you just sang, but boy, yeah. that melody is... Isn't that a cracker? Is fami- <laughs> it sounds familiar, too. Does it really? Yeah, somehow. Don't know. Don't know. I've always, know, I've always known it as the tune for that song. Where, where, where did this come from? It comes from s- the south of England. Um, round, it's round about, round about Winchester, mm-hmm. which is south of England, I think, I think. But it's certainly south of England. <laughs> and you yeah. think that's where it's from. Yeah. Uh, oh, it's certainly south of England, but I can't remember the exact place. <laughs> okay. So, so how do you go about finding these songs? Are well, you- that one's in print. Okay. A lot of these, a lot of the songs are in print. One of the great things that ha- that's happened in the uh, in in the years, well, through the sixties, and again recently, is that a whole lot of songbooks 
were published, people actually took it uh, took it upon themselves to go and dig around in mm. in the manuscript collections. And a, a fellow called Frank Perslow went and uh, looked in the collections of a man of, of the Hammond brothers and of a man called Gardner. And most of their songs were from that. That it's a sort of uh, block of counties: Hampshire, Wiltshire, Somerset, uh, especially Dorset, and occasionally into Devon. Mm-hmm. So the uh, West Country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it seems though that it is still an oral tradition, even despite you know the song. But I mean, I guess you could say records are the new <coughs> oral tradition. Oh, yeah, people, I would say that. People listening and getting stuff uh, that way. So there, there is this tradition of folk singers borrowing from each other, and there have been a couple of very famous instances of people borrowing from you. Oh, they're very welcome. I'm really delighted they did it. Bob Dylan was one and Paul Simon was the other. It was a great thing to happen. Now, Dylan, on his album Free Wheelin', he did this song, Bob Dylan's Dream, which yes, was based right. on your version of Lord Franklin. That's right. It's an old Scots ballad, isn't no, it? No, it's no, no, no. Not it's an Scots? English song. I, th- I believe. I believe, according to um, A. L. Lloyd, who was the man from whom I learned it, it was actually collected in the Falkland Islands. In really, the whaling, in the whaling station. That's what he. That's that's what he said. He heard it sung in in Port Stanley in in the Falklands. That and that would I imagine have been in the forties. Okay, but I don't know that for certain. Well, for the, the idea of going from the Falkland Islands to I Bob know. Dylan's free wheeling via Amazing, you. <laughs> uh, and, and then perhaps even more famously, uh, Scarborough Fair, yes. which Simon and Garfunkel, basically that was your arrangement that well, they heard? Um, yeah, if you like. Uh, it, it was. I mean, I learned it from a songbook. I learned it from the Singing Island, which was the Ewan McCall and Peggy Seeger songbook. Um, and I did an arrangement of it. And... Uh, in those days, we all learned off each other. Everybody right. learned off everybody else. That's how we all improved. Um, and Paul Simon always, always acknowledged that it was my work. But when he, when he talked to journalists, they basically ignored that and said, Martin, who? Like they would. <laughs> well, why would they not? Right, right. So, uh, you know, a, a, miss, a, a, a bit of um, folklore grew up around that. Yeah. Uh, but no, he never stole anything. He learned a song and he sang it. Right. Thank you very much. Now, uh, here again, we're talking about a a song that probably has pre-Christian roots, Parsley, Sage, Rosemary, and Thyme being an old sort of charm to ward off the evil eye or whatever. And and it becomes, you know, an international hit song in in the late 20th century with, again, you as the intermediary. (laughs) It's very nice. It's a great thing to happen. (laughs) It was a great thing. Uh, It was sort of a mixed blessing for you, as you say, because, I mean, at least Dylan sort of credited you on the liner notes. Uh, Paul Simon had less control over what people were writing in the press. Exactly, yeah. But uh, you've actually performed with him, like, just a couple of years ago. Uh, (coughs) He was doing a tour of Europe in, I think it was 98, and uh, one of his, I think it was his last gig in England, certainly his last gig in London. He did three nights at the uh, Hammersmith Apollo in London, and on the last night on his encore, I went on and sang Scarborough Fair. We sang Scarborough Fair together, which was a very nice thing to happen. Mm. My guest is Martin Carthy, the English folk singer and arranger. And you've been doing this for a long time. Do you refer to yourself as a, a musicologist, no. as a collector? Or? No. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a musician. That's what I do. <laughs> I sing songs. Mm-hmm. No, it's, uh, I, I suppose you, I could bend the truth a bit and call myself a bit of a musicologist because you have to go into, you have to go into sometimes have to, into, have to go into fairly obscure manuscripts to get hold of songs. But no, I'm a singer. It's, uh, I, I sing these old songs. That's what I do. And well, in, in addition to you know your your impact on the music of Dylan and, and Paul Simon, I mean, you know, just within the folk circuit, you have kind of musical stepchildren, and you have v- literal, you know, a musical family that oh, you were yes. a part of. Uh, you married Norma Watterson from the the famous Watterson family in England. Certainly did. And uh, and now y- your daughter Eliza Carthy performing yep. with the two of you as and on her own too, right. sensationally. And didn't she produce your last record? She did. She so did. She's a multi-talented threat. Oh, then. not half. Yes, <laughs> her and her bloke Benevitsky. I well, I'd been struggling to make. I'd, I'd started to make that record five five years before, and kept getting interrupted. And I just finally ran out of momentum, and I rang her up in desperation. Yeah. Well, Tony Engler topic was very nice, and he sort of rang up very quietly one day and said, "Any news about this record?" <laughs> and <laughs> So I, I got smitten with guilt, and I rang Liza up, and I just basically said, help. 
Uh, Let's let the kids quite do start, it. Yeah. Didn't quite start from scratch. Uh, I think three of the instrumental tracks, uh, as recorded by uh, Ollie Knight, who's Norma's and my nephew. Um, oh, so but, it really is a family affair. Oh yeah, Ollie's Ollie's a sound man. He often comes uh, comes on the road with us mm-hmm. as a sound man. Well, um, and then uh, and I rang Liza up and said help, and I went up and recorded it with her, and she got some of her mates from Edinburgh to come and play extra bits on it and did a fantastic job. Well, we'll hear a little bit of the recording as we, uh, as we conclude Soundcheck this afternoon. Martin Carthy, we're, we're just about out of time, but let me just uh, tell people that there are not one but two CDs out on Topic Records. Your newest is called Waiting for Angels mm-hmm. and Watterson Carthy with Fishes and Fine Yellow Sand. Yep. And then you're all out on stage at Satala tomorrow night. And Liza's got one called Rough Music, and that's a good one too. <laughs> all right, the uh, the band Watterson Carthy, uh, the nice. the England the Engl- England's first family of folk, uh, is performing ten o'clock tomorrow night at Satala on West Twenty Sixth Street. Info is online at satala.com. Martin Carthy, a real pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. I'd like to say that I, we, we, we always think that the Copper family are the first family of folk, but there we are. <laughs> <laughs> well, that'll do it for today's edition of Soundcheck. We'll give Martin Carthy the last word on the subject. Tomorrow is Bastille Day, and in honor of that, we'll pay tribute to one of France's most beloved singers, Edith Piaf. She's inspired a Boston-based tribute band called Ziaf. They'll perform live in the studio... And the Senegalese hip-hop group Dara J performing live for us tomorrow as well. Soundcheck's technical director is Irene Trudell. Our program produced by Alison Lichter and Brian Wise. Our executive producers are Chris Bannon and Elena Park. We had help from Ben Yakis. I'm John Schaefer. Join us again at this time for the next Soundcheck.